First, I want to convey a few words of thanks to our dedicated ambassador to the United Nations, who we just learned will be stepping down at the end of the year. Our nation has benefited greatly from the tough, skilled leadership that Nikki Haley brought to the UN. Her tenure will be remembered for her proud reassertion of American moral leadership and her fearless willingness to turn a bright spotlight on critical challenges from Israel's sovereignty to Iran's sponsorship of regional violence. Ambassador Haley has been a key part of the administration's team that has faced down a wide variety of critical challenges and done so with distinction. She took on this role after an impressive six years as governor of South Carolina and quickly proved to be both a skillful advocate for our national interests and a forceful spokeswoman for our principles. So I hope this is not the end of Ambassador Haley's distinguished career in public service. I want to thank her for her significant contributions to our country. Now, on another matter, yesterday I was pleased <clears throat> to attend the ceremonial swearing in to the newest member of our Supreme Court, Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Justice Kavanaugh's remarks yesterday affirmed yet again what his record and his testimony clearly told us. He'll be a thoughtful, fair-minded justice who's committed to applying our laws and our Constitution as they're actually written. His confirmation last week was a victory for the very same principles of fairness and justice that we can now count on with him, along with his fellow justices, to uphold. So, Mr. President, Saturday's vote was also a victory for the Senate, for this institution, and for the integrity of this institution. Reason and deliberation triumphed over what was literally, literally, an attempt to sway the Senate using mob tactics. I wish this were an exaggeration, but it isn't. While many came to Washington peacefully to share their stories, the loudest voices proved to be those of the politically motivated far left. The same far left special interests that had pledged total opposition to any Supreme Court nominee before the ink was even dry on Justice Kennedy's retirement, they pulled out all the stops. They did everything they could. When it became clear Justice Kavanaugh's nomination would not be stopped on the merits, well, as we know, that was only the beginning. Far-left activists decided that the United States Senate uh, and their members should be harassed and intimidated wherever they might be, in a restaurant, with family, getting out of their own car, or in their own homes. Anything went. When they did not get their way, when these tactics failed to sway us, they just turned up the anger even more. Protesters disregarded the men and women of the Capitol Police, trampled barricades, stormed the steps of the Capitol and the Supreme Court, climbed to own statues, and tried to literally shout down senators right in the middle of a roll call vote here in the Senate. When the dust settled, literally hundreds of arrests had been made. Extraordinary security measures were required to protect the Senate, the Supreme Court, as well as the Kavanaugh family. And members of this body and Senate staff have received threats of violence and murder. After all that, I'm afraid the far left had only succeeded in only one thing. They made it even more difficult for the vast majority of Americans to take them seriously. They made it difficult for most Americans to take these people seriously. But the madness hasn't stopped. They're already signaling that even more drastic steps may be necessary now that Justice Kavanaugh is on the court. Some left-wing publications are already trying to lay the groundwork for, you guessed it, literally packing the court with more justices. That's right, the far left has gone scrounging through the ash heap of American history, and they're banding about that discredited fantasy from back in the 1930s. In the meantime, while the groundwork is laid for that scheme, 
One far left pressure group is already trying to circulate petitions that Judge Justice Kavanaugh should be impeached. Justice Kavanaugh should be impeached. The mob would like to make itself perfectly clear, Mr. President, if Democrats retake Congress, quote, progressives expect them to use their full power to get Kavanaugh off the bench. So it's pretty obvious the all-consuming animosity toward this nominee, independent of all the facts and all the evidence, still being stoked. The far-left mob is not letting up. Earlier today, former Secretary of State Clinton sent this signal as clear as today. This is Secretary Clinton. She told CNN exactly how she views millions of Americans who hold different political views from her own. Here's what she said. You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for. If we're fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. No peace until they get their way. More of these unhinged tactics. Apparently, this is the left's rallying cry. But fortunately, the American people know that the fact-free politics of hate, fear, and intimidation are not how we actually govern in our democratic republic. The Senate and the nation will not be intimidated. So, Mr. President, on an entirely different matter, earlier this year, the President challenged us to seriously address our nation's crumbling infrastructure. In Congress, we've wasted no time on working to tackle this challenge in a bipartisan way. Here are just a few highlights. The funding bill for fiscal 2018 including a, included a $21 billion increase in infrastructure funding. We continued to build on that significant commitment in our historic return to regular appropriations for fiscal year 2019. Just last week, we passed the longest FAA reauthorization in more than three decades on an overwhelmingly bipartisan basis. And this week, we have the chance to keep the momentum going and advance another major victory for the American infrastructure by passing America's Water Infrastructure Act. <coughs> Chairman Brasso and Ranking Member Carper deserve a lot of credit for getting this important bipartisan legislation across the finish line. Its importance for every state in our nation really cannot be overstated. <coughs> America's ports and inland waterways give our producers access to markets around the world. More than 60 percent of our grain exports, for example, move through our inland waterways. So do other commodities such as fuel, coal, and agricultural inputs. No wonder the American Farm Bureau Federation wrote the Senate explaining that this legislation will put America's inland waterways and port infrastructure on a solid and sustainable foundation to contribute to U.S. economic growth, jobs, and global competitiveness for generations to come. This legislation covers big projects like deepening ports and ensuring the navigability of inland waterways. But it also focuses on the unique challenges communities face. It will help ensure access to functioning sewer systems and clean drinking water. On this last point, there's good reason why the chairman of the EPW committee calls this legislation the most significant drinking water infrastructure bill in decades. And when you look at its contents, it's hard to reach any other conclusion. There's more support for our rural communities as they grapple with aging water, sewer, and flood control infrastructure. The legislation includes Senator Bozeman's SRF Win Act, which puts low interest financing within reach for small and mid-sized rural communities like those 
in my home state of Kentucky. And for the first time in over 20 years, this legislation reauthorizes federal funding to states to help ensure the safety of our drinking water. The legislation also addresses environmental protection. To name just one example, it includes an important effort championed by Senator Rubio and Senator Scott to help address, and Governor Scott, to help address harmful algae blooms that have plagued Florida's waterways. These are just a few of the significant accomplishments this legislation secures. Dams and levees, flood control for our communities, safe drinking water, sewer systems in communities big and small. The bill before us addresses real needs in my state and across America. I hope each of my colleagues will join me in voting to advance America's Water Infrastructure Act later today. <clears throat> And now one final matter I'd like to conclude where I started with a few words of thanks for a job well done. Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation could not have happened without the tireless work from so many. So while I certainly can't mention everyone who deserve it, I want to take a moment to express my gratitude. First, of course, is President Trump himself for sending the Senate such a talented and qualified nominee. He and Vice President Pence are stalwart champions for the judiciary that the American people deserve. My deep gratitude, gratitude is also with White House Counsel Don McGahn. Without Don's total dedication to ensuring Judge Kavanaugh received a fair hearing, we would not be where we are today. Here in the Senate, I can't compliment enough our dear friend Chairman Grassley for his leadership of the Judiciary Committee. He balanced strong leadership with generosity and flexibility to all the members. He oversaw the most thorough, painstaking review of a Supreme Court nominee in our nation's history. Supporting Chairman Grassley and the committee, I'd like to mention Staff Director Colin Davis, Chief Nominations Counsel Mike Davis, Steve Kenney, Lauren Mailer, Andrew Ferguson, Taylor Foy, Rachel Mitchell, Catherine Willey, Jessica Boo, George Hartman, Jill Cassini, and Jennifer Hines in Senator Grassley's office, and an entire team of outstanding staff. Thanks are also due to, re to the Republican Whip, Senator Cornyn, and his excellent team, led by Monica Pop, and all of the dedicated floor staff who make this body function. Laura Dove, Robert Duncan, the entire cloakroom team, the Secretary of the Senate, parliamentarians, the clerks, reporters of debate, sergeant at arms, and our doorkeepers. On my own team, I cannot imagine this uh, process or really my office at all without the crucial leadership of Sharon Soderstrom, my chief of staff. She works harder and she is more under more pressure than almost anyone I've ever had the privilege of working with. Don Stewart, my deputy chief of staff, is the expert hand who helps keep us on a course and shapes our communication strategy. Hazen Marshall, my policy director, helped keep this and other priorities on track, including the other bipartisan policy wins the Senate delivered during the nomination debate. And John Abeg, my chief counsel and right-hand man for every step of the process. For 15 weeks, John poured his determination, his experience, and his wisdom into the process. He started working the moment Justice Kennedy announced he was stepping down and did not stop until the gavel fell. We wouldn't be here without his work. I'm grateful to my policy advisors, my communications team, and my operations staff for all the hard work and late nights they poured into the process. And to Phil Maxson and my personal office team <clears throat> for their assistance. But most important of all, Mr. President, I need to close with this. To the men and women of the United States Capitol Police and all the other law enforcement officers who kept members, staff, and citizens safe, even in extremely difficult and often hostile circumstances, we really can't thank them enough. Our representative government and the rule of law depend on their dedication, their bravery, and their sacrifice. So thank you so much for keeping the Senate safe.